just get started by saying, you know, uh, explaining to you what detainers are first. So immigration detainers are high schools. They're requests from the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, the ICE folks, to local enforcement, law enforcement. And essentially what it says is it requests that they hold the person listed in the detainer for up to 48 hours, past when they're eligible to be released. Now, it's up to the discretion, it's that same discretion that Joe Sakos was just talking about, uh, of local law enforcement to enforce that request. Now, how does this impact the community? Well, if you think about it, it's just that. They're not mandatory. ICE detainers requests are just that. They're just requests. Uh, there's no legal requirement to comply with this. So even ICE has admitted you know, in their internal documents that, and I quote, a detainer is a request. There is no penalty if local agencies don't comply. Now, I find that to be pretty interesting because this morning when I was looking up uh, various websites and on Arlington County's website, uh, I was looking at the frequently asked questions with detainers. And on their website it goes, and there's a question there that says, can Arlington elect not to honor an immigration detainer issued by ICE? And the answer to that said no. All state and local officials are required by federal regulation to honor ICE detainers. So there's this complete misinformation here by the agency, by ICE, telling them that no, you don't have to comply with this. This is simply a request. And the miscommunication with the local law enforcement agencies, which think, no, this is a mandate, so it has to be done. Um, now, an ICE detainer request does not provide a lawful basis for detention on its own. They're often issued by a lone ICE officer without due process, without higher review, or without a judicial warrant. Um, they're used for the sole purpose of investigating whether an individual has committed a civil immigration offense. Now, continuing to detain uh, a person after they're eligible for release, based purely on ICE detainer issued, you know, without probable cause, that person, that, that person is actually portal, that's clear violation of the Fourth Amendment. Um, so there's, there's that issue with, with ICE detainers in and of themselves. Another issue that we have with ICE detainers is that they're you know, incredibly expensive. If you can imagine housing somebody for 48 hours past the time when they're supposed to be released, and let me give you some numbers here. So essentially by honoring these requests, local law enforcement is actually acting as a proxy um, to enforce federal immigration law and policies while incurring the high costs of holding uh, detainees for longer periods of time. And ICE has stated, clearly, they've stated time and time again, that it, quote, does not reimburse localities for detaining any individual until ICE has assumed actual custody of that individual. So if we think about this, taxpayers here are footing the bill for something that ICE is requesting us to do that we have no need to actually comply with. Um, in a 2012 study, it found that Los Angeles County, taxpayers spent over $26 million per year on ICE detainers. In Virginia, the average statewide cost of housing inmates in 2012 was $73 a day. That same year, 6,336 detainer requests were issued in Virginia. So in 2012, 6,336 detainer requests were issued. And for holding them for 48 hours, $73 a day, if we can do the math, which I'm terrible at doing, thank God I have this paper. That means if each person listed on the detainer request is held for the full extra 48 hours, Local law enforcement would be putting the bill of $925,056 uh, $925, per year to enforce federal immigration policies. Now, aside from just the simple cost of detention, just holding people beyond when they're supposed to be held, the agency also faces the risk of legal liability um, if they choose to comply with ICE detainers. Detainer lawsuits are a regular occurrence, um, and although the request comes from ICE, the choice to comply with them comes from the state, local, or county, uh, and, and therefore they're, el they're liable for potential damages. And, and in fact, in 2011, Jefferson County in Colorado agreed to pay $40,000 to an individual uh, after they held that man for 47 days past the 48-hour requirement. So this isn't something that's due. This isn't something that's you know an anomaly. This is a common occurrence. I mean, mistakes are made. In New York City in 2008, uh, New York City decided to agree to settle with a man for $145,000 because he was wrongfully held on an ICE detainer for a, a total of 140 days. And in 2010, in Spokane County, Washington, they agreed to pay $35,000 uh, $35, settlement 
to a man who was wrongfully held without bail for 20 days because of a nice detainer. And throughout the country, this is happening. These are mistakes. And granted, that they might be mistakes that, you know, unwittingly, unknowingly, but at the end of the day, it's costing these localities valuable resources. I mean, this is money that could have been spent doing a, a variety of different things. Um, so aside from the cost, they, you know, the way that ISIS sold this program, the detainers and everything else, is it's essentially told localities that they're going to be targeting serious offenders. Well, we found that that's not true. You know, while they say that they're targeting serious, criminal, uh, serious criminals, Evidence shows that the vast majority of those who are detained often have no prior criminal record or have only committed a minor traffic violation. And, the, and, and even, uh, you know, we, we have 34% of ICE detainers issued in Virginia are for those with no criminal record whatsoever. So to say that this is uh, something that's combating uh, serious criminals, it's, it's not true. I mean, the numbers just don't lie there. Um, like I've stated, you know, in the just right now, ICE frequently makes mistakes. The lack of procedural reviews for ICE detainer requests, it makes them more susceptible to error, including the frequent detention of US citizens, which has been, you know, some of the cases that have been highlighted in the media, which I'm sure you guys have heard. In Washington State, for example, a man named Renson Castillo, a US citizen and army veteran, was held for seven months in an immigration detention facility after ICE placed a detainer on him, a, a US citizen was held. And despite his multiple attempts to prove that he, you know, he was a citizen, that he was lawfully here, after, you know, they just held him for seven months, and after his release, acts just admitted their mistake, saying that they misspelled his name on the records and assigned him multiple file numbers. Now this, as you can imagine, also undermines public safety. Because immigration status is something that law enforcement agencies can hold over someone's head. If they don't choose to comply, with law enforcement, that's something that they can use against you and say, you know, if, if you're not going to cooperate with us, then you can just call ICE, have them handle this, um, which makes people obviously a lot more hesitant to reach out to law enforcement when they are injured. You know, there was a case here in uh, Arlington, I believe, that happened a while ago. Um, well, in PG County, that's where it was, right, right, right. And it was Maria Baduanos Hernandez. It was a Christmas Eve. I don't know sure if you remember, there's a lot of meeting around the DMV area. Um, she had a heated argument with the father of her two-year-old daughter. Argument turned violent. She called the police for help. And to this day, she says that she regrets making that call. The Prince George's County police officers who responded to the call charged her with illegally selling a $10 phone card, which the charge was later dismissed because it was not, it, it, there was no basis for it. Um, but in the meantime, they had already run her fingerprints through the database. Um, and what ended up happening is those fingerprints were then sent to ICE, who sent an immigration detainer request to PG County, and then detained her and turned her over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, for that. And what ended up happening is, like, the only contact she had with local law enforcement was that one call for help. And that turned into a nightmare for her. If that happens in one case, why would anyone want to reach out for help if they don't have a lawful immigration status? If they know that this is something that could happen to them? they're less likely to reach out for help, and they're less likely to actually aid the police if they do see a crime being committed, because they're more fearful of deportation than anything else. Um, so just to wrap it up, in order to put our communities first, what we really need to do is ensure that local jurisdictions reduce or completely eliminate their compliance with ICE detainers. Every day, ICE detainers are violating constitutional rights, draining scarce local resources, and undermining law enforcement's relationship with the community, which is vital in order to uh, preserve public safety. A growing number of localities, and this is what really you know, makes me think that there's work that needs to be done and it's actually able to be done. Like, I'm very hopeful about this issue because across the US, a growing number of localities in different states are choosing not to honor ICE detainers because of their question of legality and the cost and the community impacts. In fact, According to the American Immigration Council, over 100 cities and counties across the country have restricted their compliance with ICE detainer requests. And I think it's about time that Virginia joins in. And that's, I'm so happy to have you all here because like I said, this is going to be uh, a battle that's fought you know, locality by locality um, because they vary. So whoever's in charge of detaining, whoever's in charge of uh, housing uh, people on, on, on arrests, they have the discretion to say whether or not they're going to comply with ICE detainers. And that's why we need you guys and some of the advocates here uh, from Harrisonburg. Uh, you know, it's great to have to have such a great show here. Um, and, and
it's, and it's really helpful for me. I'm really happy that you all get it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Joseph. So now we're going to do. Uh...